Hello. As always, I hope this finds you abiding in the love of our Lord and abounding in God's grace. In just a minute, I'm going to tell you what this video is about, but I just wanted to show you that I'm recording from my beautiful home office here. It's a cold night, and as you can see, got this nice cozy little fire going. So, ah, uh, come and join me. Okay, this is bonus material. Yes, a bonus class just for you. It's designed to help us cover things outside of the in-person classes so we can move along. It's already been, what, 10 classes I've done and we're still in the opening verses of Romans chapter 1. I mean, uh, even this guy right here is like, come on. Uh, pick up the pace. When a baby sloth, adorable baby sloth, is telling you to speed it up, y you know you need to move along. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is cover more of the text outside of class and make it available in these videos so that I can kind of jump ahead and get further along in class and I'll just refer the class to these videos that will be available at my, as you see here, at my, my Kiss the Sun YouTube channel. And I want you to be able to, I mean, obviously, if you're watching this video, you know how to get to it. But if you're not aware of how to watch the videos at a faster speed, again, I, I've gone through that in some videos in the past, but I, I'm going to provide a link and maybe make a video to show you how to do that so that way you can you can watch them on as much as double speed or at least one and a half speed and that will help you get through the classes more quickly and that's the design here. I want I want to move us along so what I what I'm planning to do then is cover things that are that are in the text so that I can kind of set us up to go ahead and move along and get to the big stuff to uh, cover in the in-person classes, the key texts, but still get to cover a lot of the little things in between that I just feel are so rich and important and we just don't always have time to do in class. I just can't cover every single thing that comes to mind from every key term in every sentence of every passage. I know if I do that, then in class we'll never get through Romans, but we can do more study here this way, and then again I can move along then with the class on Sunday mornings. The last class that we had on Sunday morning uh, a couple of weeks ago was class number 10, so this one will be class 11, obviously, but um, those who are not accessing the additional material through the YouTube channel uh, might wonder why all of a sudden we go from class number 10 to class number 12. So I'll just have to make sure I let people know that there's additional material they, they can access, and I'm just going to number the classes this way um, keep them in sequence even if some of the classes are not on Sunday morning with the in-person class they're still going to be numbered in, in sequence with the other so that I hope that was completely confusifying it either made no sense at all or it was completely unnecessary to explain but I want you to notice this right here ah yes look at this as you know it's very important that you uh, have at hand at all times a refreshing beverage and that coffee looks delicious. I drink a lot of coffee every day and uh, by the way that is the way the good Lord intended for us to drink it black pure and undefiled. Please keep that in mind because it's a fact. So these additional classes will not only allow us to cover things that we don't have maybe time to address in detail in the in-person classes, but also, you see, what this does then 
is it allows me to sleep at night. Uh, you see, um, w when I worry about things that we didn't cover in the class and I'm worried about whether I should go back and make sure to get them in and make sure to say something about them. And I really do, unfortunately, obsess too much over that kind of thing. And uh, this works out great because it allows me then to cover everything I want to cover without uh, slowing the class down too much on Sunday morning, hopefully. And then uh, I can uh, rest well knowing that, hey, I did cover that after all. Even if I didn't cover it in class, I went home and made additional, an uh, additional class and provided additional material. And so, yes, I can sleep. And I like this image because once again, once again, let me see if I can uh, slide these things out of you. Because once again, you see uh, you have your, your refreshing beverage at hand, which is, which is very important. And then maybe you've got your, maybe you're watching with your cell phone. And that, and that phone's kind of dated right there. <laughs> that phone is a, a, a little bit dated. But it'd uh, be good to have your Bible. Whoops. Your Bible right there. And then... You know, maybe your notes right here, and then you can listen along, and uh, yeah. Oh, but uh, just want to make sure to point out so everyone knows that the flowers, uh, flowers are optional. Okay. Okay, so where we left off in class, we were talking about the obedience of faith, how Paul uses that expression here at the beginning and at the end of Romans. And I tried to cover the different possible meanings of it and why it's important. It, it could be the subjective genitive, the obedience of faith could mean the obedience that produ is produced by faith, that comes from faith. The NIV, I believe, actually renders the text that way, the obedience from faith. And that's highly interpretive, actually. I prefer that, that they give us a more literal rendering of the text, obedience of faith, and let the reader interpret, let the reader decide on what it means, rather than the translators doing that. Well, they took it upon themselves there to give you what they thought was the meaning, the obedience from, or that comes from, faith. But it, it could be the appositional uh, genitive here, the idea that it is faith. The obedience that God requires is to believe. The obedience of faith that consists in faith, in trusting Him. So we said, well, um, we really need to look at how Paul uses, uh, how Paul speaks, whoops, how Paul speaks of obedience in uh, in the book of Romans, and so I uh, hurriedly went through, I mentioned uh, some of these texts and looked at a few of them, went through a few of these verses here, but I think in trying to explain it, I did a poor job, and some people were confusified by what I said, and the whole reason I wanted to make this class, uh, do this additional class, is so that I wouldn't have to take up time in class on Sunday morning, but could hopefully do a better job of it here. I decided to, to, to sort of simplify it as you'll see here in a moment and I hope then what I'm about to explain will make it clear what I was trying to get at when I was going through all of that in class last time. Okay, so we said that uh, it can be actually both. It, it can be, and I think that's what you find in the book of Romans and in Paul's writings in the New Testament and really in the Bible as a whole that um, it is the fact that faith produces obedience. When we truly believe God, it results in a life of submission to Him. So you can speak of the obedience that comes from faith and you can speak of really the obedience that is faith, that consists in faith. It can be both, and what I was trying to say is that it is in fact both, uh, 
And that therefore, that can include even how we become saved. That, uh, that actually believing on the Lord in order to be saved can include obedience to conditions. That's what I was getting at here. Let's, let's have a little conversation here with these characters I have and see if I can clarify things a little bit. Okay, so we've got Ted here, and let's say Ted's talking to Kelly, and he's trying to explain to Kelly that in order to be saved, part of the process of receiving salvation is being baptized in water for the remission of sins, as Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16 and other passages teach. So receiving salvation by faith, the justification that comes by faith, that, that that includes, that faith is an obedient faith that should lead us to submit to whatever God requires. And one of the things God requires, we're, we are to repent and to confess Christ as Lord and then be baptized, to be immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. But now here's a common objection here. Uh, Kelly says, no, 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 no. You see, Paul in Romans says we're saved by faith and not our works. That's probably the main objection that people make uh, to the idea that baptism is a part of being saved by faith, that it's a, an essential condition in order to receive salvation. So Ted says, well, yes, yes, of course. It's true we're saved by faith and not works, that our works are not the basis of our justification. The work of Christ is the basis of our justification and we receive the benefits of what Jesus did for us on the cross by faith. But what uh, Ted is trying to say here, let's, let's see what he says. Of course, but true saving faith is obedient trust. It's not faith only. It's not just having a, 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 a scent in your mind that something is true, that Jesus is the Son of God and that simply coming to that conclusion in your mind and believing it, that that alone, with nothing else, results in being saved at that moment. And typically how that's expressed by people is you, you say a prayer inviting Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior, and you're saved at that moment. But let's look at what Ted's trying to explain to Kelly, that it's an obedient trust, not faith only. And he said, that's why Paul speaks of obedience of faith. See, I was trying to explain that when we encounter that expression in Romans here. See, that's what Paul means, obedience of faith. But now Kelly replies, well, I agree that genuine faith will lead to obedience, it will result in a changed life. But, you see, obedience comes after we get saved, not in order to get saved. Ah, you see? So that's why people, I believe, then are confused and will say, uh, so Baptism is an act of obedience that comes after, after we are saved by faith. It's not something to get saved. Now, in reply, Ted says, well, but Paul says faith and obedience go together, both in receiving salvation and living it out. And so Ted then refers to that expression, obedience of faith, that's at the beginning and end of the very book where Paul says we're saved, we're justified by faith and not by works of law or else otherwise it, it wouldn't be of grace, he's going to say. And so he points out, Ted points out, though, in, that, in this very letter at the beginning and end of Romans, Paul speaks of the obedience of faith. And in chapter 6, 
he speaks of baptism as the point at which our faith has led us to be baptized in order to die so the old man can die and be buried and then the new man at that point rises to walk in newness of life. That's when the new life begins. And then a few verses later, he says, when you obey from the heart, that's the obedient trust that we're talking about, the obedience of faith. He's saying it's then you're set free from sin. So obedience can be a part of the faith that moves us to receive salvation. And then, of course, it produces an obedient life. Um, then it should result, uh, it should continue to be expressed in obedience in a life of submission to the Lord. So hopefully Ted cites those passages and explains that. And then Kelly says, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I will look at those verses again. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we always responded that way when, uh, when we tried to make our case from the Bible? Uh, unfortunately, that isn't usually how we respond or how others respond. But we should. We should be willing to listen and to uh, examine what people say and think carefully about it and reply in a polite and loving way. But unfortunately, um, that, that doesn't always happen, does it? But we should strive for that, surely. Now that's how I'm trying to explain a little better what I meant about the obedience of faith and how important it is. Let me, let me just look at, let me just put it this way for you. The, the problem with people rejecting baptism as an act that, it is a, that is essential in order to receive salvation is they want to completely separate, see? They want to completely separate faith and obedience prior to salvation. So they don't, they don't want any kind of action on your part over here in order to get saved. So they only want to say, you know, it's something that follows after you receive salvation, uh, an, an obedient life. And, and one act of obedience after you're saved is baptism. But they say you can't have it over here, right? It can only be after you're saved. But actually what we're trying to show is that Paul in Romans and throughout the New Testament the Word of God is showing that the faith that leads to salvation is itself an obedient faith and that after we receive salvation, our faith should, should lead us to continue to, to submit to the Lord and to live a transformed life as His disciple, to be faithful to His will. So there's, there's obedience, you see, uh, in the process of, of receiving salvation obedience of faith, and then there is obedience that is a part of the saved life. Obedience of faith. What a rich expression, and I think it's helpful in, um, it's helpful in getting people to see that salvation by faith, not of works, does not mean that uh, there are no conditions in order to receive salvation in fact, our faith should lead us to comply with those conditions. All right, I've talked at the death. I've said it as many different times and in, in as many ways as I possibly can. Please forgive the redundancy, but I really felt like um, that people weren't understanding my point. And I know this is a big, big issue with a lot of people. And we can really sum it up this way. What Paul is saying is that faith and obedience are two sides of the same coin. I love this coin so much, so I use that, this uh, United States $1 coin. You don't see these very often, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, notice, in God we trust. But uh, we could, here, let's, this will show it, I think, a little bit better, that faith and obedience always go 
hand in hand. So that when the Bible talks about believing to be saved, like in Acts 16 and verse 30, when Paul tells the uh, Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord and you'll be saved. Well, uh, believing on the Lord involves submitting to whatever the Lord requires. And then Paul did in fact then teach the jailer the gospel. If you read on in Acts chapter 16, he took him that very same hour of the night and baptized him. His faith was an obedient faith. And so two sides of the same coin, the book of Romans shows, it's ironic that people use the book of Romans to try to suggest that baptism is not essential to salvation uh, because we're saved by faith alone apart from any, any obedience whatsoever on man's part. And yet, uh, the truth of the matter is, you see in the book of Romans, a careful study shows there are two sides, faith and obedience, of the same coin, and that true saving faith always goes hand in hand with obedience. Okay, I tell you, I, I really know how to beat a dead horse there, right? But um, maybe that'll be useful to some. So going back to the text finally, that expression there, the obedience of faith, and as we noted, it comes up again at the end of the letter, forms an inclusio with all that Paul says. But I passed by, I passed by this, and I really wanted to notice this, where he talks about um, through Jesus Christ, verse 5, through whom, referring to Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship. Grace and apostleship. Okay, well... You might look at that at first and think he's talking about two things. The Lord has given us grace, like saving grace. And then in addition to, to that, he's granted Paul and, and the other apostles this apostleship. Uh, but let's, let's look at that expression, grace and apostleship. What I think this is, is a hendiadis. And a hendiadis is, let me just give you a couple of examples of it and you'll see what I mean. But essentially, that's when you... You substitute a conjunction for a subordination. It's, I know, that's, uh, I know, really helpful, huh? But I know Rose wants to hear the technical definition of it. But it's when, when you have two words linked together with the conjunction and. Uh, but really, the one is modifying the other. It's not two separate things. Look, simple example will show you what I mean. Like when we say nice and warm, we don't really mean it's two different things. We don't mean, yeah, well, it's nice today, and additionally, it's warm. We just mean it's nicely, nicely warm. Uh, but see, that's an awkward way to say it. But we say nice and warm. Or we say good and fat. Uh, he's good and fat. Or rather, uh, maybe there's uh, uh, some pigs nearby and a person wants to buy one of the pigs to make some tasty bacon. Ah, uh, And you say, well, well, look, that pig is good and fat. Well, you don't mean the pig is good is one thing. And then in addition to being good, the pig is also fat. Good and fat. You mean really fat, right? You're not talking about two different things. And so uh, that's a hendiadis, okay? We use that kind of language uh, all the time and you understand what people mean by it. Uh, so grace and apostleship, I think, means just the grace of apostleship. That he's not talking about two separate things here, but an apostleship received by grace. All right. And the reason, the reason that is worth mentioning, I think, is uh, look at it, how he's describing the the divine gift, really, his apostleship is a gift of God's grace. The grace and apostleship, the grace of his apostleship that being appointed as an apostle and serving in that way was a manifestation of God's grace. So grace means favor, and, and it's not always a reference to salvation and he's often going to use the word grace that way in the le in, in this letter but look how he uses it i think this is a great example of what we're talking about here look how he uses it later in chapter 12 this is really good here where he says for you see this is what we're talking about by the grace 
by the grace that was given to me. Well, he's referring to the favor of God, um, the favor that God bestowed upon him in making him an apostle so that he can now make this appeal to them. And so by the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to everyone among you, not. and then he goes on to say uh, that we ought to be humble and we ought to be willing to serve one another in the body of Christ. So l look at this in verse 4. He says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So having gifts that differ according to, there it is, according to the grace given to us. See, I love that, um, that whatever we're able to do in building up the body of Christ is really a manifestation of God's grace. So he says, um, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, uh, let us use them. And then he does list some gifts here that were available in the early church that I, I do not think were intended to be available to the saints of God in perpetuity. They were in the apostolic age, like the gift of prophecy, for example. But he lists some other gifts that I think are things that we still have. Uh, he talks about teaching and exhortation when you exhort and edify and encourage each other. Some have a gift of generosity. We'll talk about that if we ever get to uh, Romans chapter 12, but he talks about showing acts of mercy. Uh, and, but these are all graces that God has granted to us. And so all I wanted to say, the point rather, uh, I wanted to say a lot about it and I did, but the point uh, I'm trying to make here is that any good we can do for others to serve one another and build up the body of Christ is by the grace of God. It's a gift God has given us. And so Paul says, use it. Use it. Whatever grace God has given to us, um, we, need, we need to use those gifts um, and we need to recognize them as having been granted to us by, by the favor of God. I just think it's beautiful to look at the abilities that we have to do good for one another as gifts of God's grace. Now, let's notice something else tremendously important in that passage in verse 5 as well. When Paul says, now, um, I receive through whom, verse 5, through Jesus Christ, that is, he received this... Uh, grace of apostleship as we as we mentioned and why was it that he was sent out by the lord through whom i received this grace of apostleship uh, he was sent out with the gospel uh, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations <laughs> but look at that statement right there tremendously important for the sake of his name for the sake of his name. You see, salvation, we, we have a highly individualistic idea of salvation, I think, in modern Western culture, in the modern church, and of course in the prosperity gospel and in the sort of, uh, in this selfie generation, in this um, generation absorbed with self, that, that has actually carried over into the way people think about their salvation. Uh, many times the church has been canonized or uh, it thinks more like the culture than, um, than like Christ. But a lot of times these concepts, uh, people lose sight of the fact that, okay, yes, salvation, of course, is, it's, about, it's for my benefit, but it's about more than that. It's for the sake of His name. It's to bring glory to God. How, how can you see that expression and not think of Psalm 23, 3, for example, uh, when you talk about for his name's sake? In Psalm 23, David, in one of the most familiar and beloved passages in all the Bible, he says that uh, of the Lord that he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name 
name's sake. Well, well of course, it was for, for his benefit, but it was for more than his benefit. It was for the sake of the name of God and for the glory it brings to God when he is acting on behalf of his people. And that's imagery that we find in the prophets and especially in Isaiah um, in the way that God speaks of his people. Notice uh, just a couple of passages here from Isaiah 43. In verse 7, God speaks of Israel. He says uh, of Israel, everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Why did he, why did he make Israel? Why did he redeem them and make them his own people for his glory? And I've uh, spliced, together, uh, spliced together the text here, but in verse 21, he speaks of the people whom I formed, I formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. Well, wow, that's exactly what Peter says in citing the prophets in 1 first, uh, first Peter 2.9. Uh, that He says that of the church, okay? So, and then look down, uh, look down in verse 25 here, and you'll notice um, he says something similar. And Isaiah's talking about how uh, God, the, the people were going to uh, sin and persist in rebellion against God and be carried away into captivity, but he was going to bring them back and forgive them. And, and he says, I, and he is the one doing that. I, I am he, verse 25, who blots out your transgressions. Look at this. Why? For my name's sake, you see. Uh, salvation is, th this whole salvation thing, if I can say it that way, is about much, much more. Much, much more than me. See, we need to have the big picture. And that's something Paul brings out again and again in Romans. And he's going to uh, a talk about how this gospel and being justified by faith in the work of Christ, this is all ultimately for the glory of God. And I think that's uh, brought out, and we don't have time even now to look at all of those references, but let, let me just say that I think the, the one that especially stands out here is, is uh, going to be uh, chapter 11 at the end of the whole doctrinal section, as we call it, or the, the thesis that Paul sets out before he then shifts into the application and what we think of sometimes as the practical um, side then of the letter. As he concludes, as he contemplates the wonder and the marvel of God's plan and his power and his sovereignty and his wisdom, he, he bursts into praise and he says, of him and to him and through him are, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. See, it's all about uh, how God's saving work in us and in the world is for his name's sake. What does Paul say? He was sent out for the sake of his name. And I think that comes out so powerfully and beautifully in Ephesians 1 and several passages there. And I've got them right here. I'm just going to note them with you quickly. Um, but you see how much more there is to cover why I'm wanting to do these classes to supplement what we're studying in class on Sunday morning. But in, in Ephesians 1, what, what do we find here? where Paul says, you know, notice in verse 6 that our salvation, the whole purpose of God to adopt us and make us his children, of course, it's for our benefit. But he says here, it's to the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of the glory of his grace. I use that expression in prayer uh, all the time that I want to so live so that I'll be to the praise of the glory of God's grace. I, and uh, and it's just a great expression to inform our prayer life, I think, but uh, or to keep this concept in mind. And then he then says, uh, as you look down a little bit further, and he says, uh, in whom, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. We've been, we've been predestined according to the counsel of his will. And why? Why all of this? So that we, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Wow, so there are different ways uh, 
it's being, it's being worded in the text. And then down in verse 14, who is the Holy Spirit's given to us. He's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of His glory. You see how Paul repeats it? He begins the text with it. He says it again in the middle. He repeats it at the end. And that is, uh, there's no, you couldn't emphasize it uh, any more than the way Paul does there in Ephesians chapter 1 where he says this whole plan, this whole purpose, this eternal purpose of God to redeem us, it's all uh, for the sake of His name. Our salvation is ultimately to bring glory to God. That's why I'm here. That's why He made us. And that's why He has redeemed us. And that should be the goal of my life is for everything to revolve around bringing praise to His name that I'm here and, and I've been redeemed by Christ for the sake of His name. Okay, finally, moving on now. Paul says that he is writing to you who, look at verse 6, including you. See, this purpose to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name, he says, that includes you. And I can say the same thing to you, dear soul, Dear brother or sister in Christ or beloved friend, listen, I can say the same thing to you. It's true of me as well. It includes you. He says, including you who are called. I just wanted to notice this idea of being called. He said, you're called to be Christ's or to belong to Christ. Different translations will render this different ways, but I like the way it is here in, in the ESV. You've been called to belong to Jesus Christ. But this idea of calling is important in Romans in a, in a great text in this letter when he says, we know f uh, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For whom? For those who are called. And we're called according to his purpose. And I think our, our calling is brought about. We respond to that calling when we hear the gospel. Paul says we're called, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, by the gospel or through the gospel. But then Paul, going back to Romans 8, he said, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might uh, be the firstborn among many. But then in verse 30, he says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. So this idea of being called of God will be important as we proceed in Romans. You remember I said, here at the beginning of, beginning of the letter, a little like the prologue of John, but not quite to that extent, uh, many of the major themes that Paul's going to address are introduced here. And that shows you this is carefully crafted, that Paul no doubt is reciting this uh, to Tertius, who's writing it down, uh, and he's, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but look at how thoughtfully and carefully this is crafted to bring all this to our attention here at the beginning of the letter that we will then come to understand or see develop later as we continue. But notice, let's, uh, let's move on because then he says to all those in Rome who are loved by God, look at all these beautiful things that are said here. I mean, I just couldn't pass by them. That's why I had to have this... <laughs> I had to have this class uh, to get this in. To, you're loved by God. To all those in Rome who are, now some translations will have it, beloved of God. But it's the idea of you are, we don't say beloved very often. I used it just a moment ago myself. It's not uh, a common expression, or we don't use it commonly. But you, you see Paul in this letter talks about the love of God. Um, that's poured in our hearts, chapter 5 and verse 5, by His Spirit and how that, um, that in, in, this is the text I love so much in, in chapter 5 where Paul talks about the love um, that the justification we receive being saved from His wrath is a manifestation of His love. God chose His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then chapter 8, look at, look at the, or remember the text in chapter 8 where Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, wow, loved of God. To think that uh, Paul is writing to those who are loved of God. Now, you might say, well, well 
Doesn't God love everyone? Couldn't that just be said of everyone? I mean, aren't we all loved of God, everyone in the world? Well, it's true. Uh, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God, there's a love that God has for everyone. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But then there's a love that God has, a special love for His people. His people who are the objects of His special love love and concern. So that's why Jesus in chapter 14, in John chapter 14 and verse 21, he, he make, here you have this letter where we're told, or this gospel where we're told God loves the whole world, but then Jesus said, you know, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So there's a special, when we love God, there is a special love that we receive that, that isn't upon the whole world, uh, that is special to us. So there, there is a sense in which we are the special objects of God's love, a beautiful thought again, uh, additionally. And then now look at, and then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Now here you have kind of a, a, a mixing of concepts. Let me get this straight here. Okay, hopefully that's, that's lined up a little bit better there. But grace to you and peace. So uh, he, you've got the, you might think of it this way as you have sort of, here you have the typical Hebrew greeting, Shalom. Shalom, but also that God, for God's grace to be, be upon you, Paul takes the typical Hebrew greeting and he brings it in with the, a common Greek, uh, a, a way that the, that the you know, Gentiles would greet each other. Uh, and, but these are together, really, in the uh, priestly blessing in number 6, 24 through 26. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious. See, there's grace. And the Lord uh, lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. So that's a common greeting of Paul, and it's a beautiful way uh, for us to greet each other, though we don't use that language, unfortunately, very often. But Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's more we could say there, but we've got to get to his uh, expression of thanksgiving. And that's here, beginning in verse 8. And as we pointed out, the, the book of Romans is much more than a letter, but it is a letter. It is in the form of a letter, and it was common in letters in the ancient world. This was typical of the form that letters would take, is to have, uh, after the initial address and greeting an expression of gratitude to give thanks and so Paul does that he's following the form uh, that was typical of a letter of that day and here his thanks is given to God through Jesus Christ for all of you he says because your faith is proclaimed your your faith is proclaimed in all the world but it's interesting at the end of the letter as I pointed out he says something very similar, only, only he says, your obedience is declared in all the world. Ah, you see, that's a great example of what we were talking about, how Paul almost speaks of faith and obedience interchangeably. Uh, they're, they're that much, um, they're connected that much that he can speak of their faith known throughout all the world and then turn right around and refer to the same thing as their obedience that is known in all the world because of the way uh, faith and obedience are related and what we what we already discussed. Now notice he, he speaks of their faith being proclaimed in all the world. What does that mean? Th that it was heard literally all around the globe in what we would call now today North America, South America. It was uh, known in China and in India and in Australia and in, in Antarctica. And, well, I mean, what does he mean when he says all the world? Literally, 
all the world. Well, that's an expression uh, that Paul will use several times referring to the, the known Gentile world or the Roman world, the Mediterranean world, really. Um, and you see it, for example, later in chapter 10, I'll speak about uh, the sound of the gospel going into all the world. And Colossians 1 verse 23 is a, a good example where Paul talks about how the gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven <laughs> or to every creature. And in Jesus in Matthew 24, 14, um, in the Olivet Discourse, talks about um, the end can't come until the gospel is proclaimed in all the world. Well, you, those references like that, they're referring to the Gentiles or the Roman world. And so um, keep, keep that in mind. That he doesn't, it doesn't mean the entire planet here. But so we need to understand the context in which these statements are using and what 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 they're intended to include and what and what they're not including. All right. But notice here, Paul then um, I'm trying to keep things lined up here, but then he says, then he says, For God is my witness. So really, uh, that's taking an oath and calling God. Uh, you're saying, I swear to this. And I have a witness to this, and the one who will testify on my behalf as a witness is for me is God, because God knows what I'm saying is true. Well, that's just a very strong, that's a way to say something very strongly, very passionately, very seriously. And we might think, well, but didn't uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain forbid that sort of thing? But, well, no, Jesus, for I don't think uh, that's what, I mean, obviously, Jesus wasn't forbidding that because Paul's doing that here. Jesus was forbidding frivolous oath-taking, not being people of our word. The Sermon on the Mountain has a lot of statements like that that appear to be ethical absolutes but are really highly qualified. But Paul's going to use this language again later, very powerfully in chapter 9, um, where he's going to talk about his conscience bears witness to him. And he's going to talk about how uh, that God bears witness to him. And there, he, there he's talking about the great sorrow that he has in his heart. I'm not, I'm not lying, he says. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit, even with the Holy Spirit. And you'll see that elsewhere uh, in Paul's letters. It's common for him, Philippians 1.8. Yes, though, Jesus did talk about um, that, that we shouldn't swear in the sense that we shouldn't be calling God to witness to things that we have no intention of keeping. I think false oaths, frivolous oaths, uh, you know, not being people of our word, that's the sort of thing. And thinking that somehow you could craft an oath, an, an oath where you could be clever in uh, the way you worded it so that you could seem to be promising something, but that technically you wouldn't be bound to it because of the way you took the oath. That's the sort of thing Jesus is addressing, I think, in those passages and that James then reiterates in, in James 5.12. But then he says this. Now this is great. This, I absolutely love this right here because he says uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this sort of thing in the church is one of the reasons I, I like it so much. But he says, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Whom I serve in my spirit. Oh, it might not seem like a... a all that significant of an expression, but um, think about it this way. Now, he could be saying that, look, it's not simply something that I do um, outwardly, but that it's really genuine and from the heart I serve with my spirit. But really, this is, when you serve with my spirit, it's, it's what we would call, um, I think, cultic language. And it's the Greek term latruo, latruo. We're going to see uh, Paul saying something like this later in chapter 12 in verse 1 when he talks about giving yourself, your whole self, as an offering to God, right? Uh, Therefore, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
All right, and so you have similar language used there. And, and so it's the idea of serving in a priestly capacity. One, um, let me see if I can get this on, on the screen here. One uh, commentator says it, what, what Paul is saying is here, whom I worship by proclaiming the gospel. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. I think that's a, a, a possible way of looking at what Paul said here, that this is an act of worship related to God to proclaim the gospel of his son that he was sent out to proclaim. that. So in other words, you can think of your obedience to the calling of God and your use of the gifts of God that you have by the grace of God as a, as a worship of God, right? So keep that in mind because a lot of times we talk about the five acts of worship as though those are the only ways that we can worship. But the cultic language, the language of priestly language of worship is used more broadly than that in the Bible. That's why I'd prefer to say more precisely there are five things we do in the assembly when we assemble on Sunday on the first day of the week. Um, that might be a better way to say it, but I know that might not make for the best uh, little songs to sing with our, with, with our youngsters. We're at 51 minutes. Okay, so Paul says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. Uh, that's something you see Paul say over and over in his letters. What a prayer life Paul had. That would be a whole nother discussion, a whole nother subject. We're just noting it here in passing how fervently and faithfully and frequently, hey, that would make a great, that make a good little lesson, wouldn't it? We've got our alliteration and our three points there. But, but you see how devoted Paul was to prayer and he wants them to know without ceasing, I mention you, uh, always in my prayers. Now what? What is Paul telling them? Always in my prayers, asking that somehow, <laughs> I love that word, <laughs> asking that somehow, I mean, Paul doesn't have to know how, he doesn't have to tell God how to get it done or how to work out the details, but just that somehow uh, that, that he could arrive by, by the will of God. And of course, Paul has no idea or doesn't realize at this time how it's going to be. He'll end up coming to Rome, won't he? Uh, but not as he had thought to uh, go out from there then to Spain and be supported by the congregations there in Rome. He comes as a prisoner, right? And he is released for a time, but then he'll appear before Nero and ultimately be beheaded in Rome. So, you know, his plans for being in Rome and how this all finally came about were much different than what he might have been asking for in these prayers. But he's just saying, well, that somehow, well, the somehow ends up being by uh, arriving as a pris prisoner. But he says here, this very important expression, that by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. He wants them to know he's been wanting to arrive. But So let's think about this, though, first, about this idea that uh, by the will of God, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. He's going to say that again at the end of the letter, that he's hoping through their prayers that it will be by God's will that he can come and see them. Uh, you see that Paul saying that, for example, he told uh, the saints in Ephesus in Acts 18, 21, I hope if the Lord wills, I'm going to return. And he's in 1 Corinthians 4:19, 1 Corinthians 16, 7. Uh, you know, I hope to come see you if the Lord wills. It seems to be an expression used a lot about plans to travel and to see others and realizing that this is all subject to, to the will of God. And I love especially um, 1 Peter 3. I'm just mentioning a couple other verses, Hebrews 6, 8. But wow, 1 Peter 3, 15, you know, says, well, uh, it's better to suffer for doing good than uh, for doing evil, if that should be God's will. So it might be God's will 
that um, I suffer for doing what's right. But you see, we're just acknowledging that we're uh, we're all we realize all of our plans are subject to what God's will is. So He just says, "I hope by the will of God that He'll be able to come and see them. It'll all be subject to what God's will may be." And uh, uh, keep that we keep that in mind when we pray as well. As James said that uh, when we make our plans, we need to be humble and uh, not presumptuous and realize it's all it's all subject to what God's ultimate will is and that might include that's why I like that passage in Peter because that, that might actually include uh, that might include having to suffer but uh, that's not what people want to think you know God's will is but uh, we need to we need to keep that in mind and then here he says for I long to see you verse 11 I want to see you that I might impart that I might impart to you some, some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Spiritual gift. I think here, since he's saying, I want to be there so I can impart this gift to you, it, it seems to be he's talking about the apostolic laying on of hands whereby he could give miraculous gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and 14.1, in that context, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth about spiritual gifts, and he, he mentions tongues and uh, the gift of prophecy and that. So these were uh, gifts that were imparted. He uses that language. Well, um, you see Paul using that language when he, when he talks to, to Timothy, and that Timothy had something given to him through the laying on of hands. For example, that you notice I've got underlined 2 Timothy 1 6. For this reason, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God. The gift of God. And Paul here is talking about, right? Some gift. Uh, the gift of God, he says, that is in you through the laying on of my hands. So I think here, and you see in Acts chapter 8, and again in Acts 19, that the apostles had the ability to impart. Uh, supernatural gifts in the early church for the edification of the church through the laying on of their hands. And so obviously since there are no apostles today, the Bible does not teach uh, apostolic secession. And so now that the apostles are all dead, um, these, this would not then be applicable to us. But still, in chapter 12, Paul's going to talk about other gifts that we can have and that we need to use for the, for the glory of God. So, okay, look at, look at how Paul then says, so that, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Mutually encouraged by... See, Paul needs their uh, encouragement as much as they need his. So it's by each other's faith, both yours and mine right? We need each other to build each other up. And, and then notice he says here, but I, I did not, you see, even my point is here is that even, even Paul, even Paul the apostle, the one the church was relying on to strengthen them, and Paul said, I need, I need your encouragement and I need your strength. So notice, mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine, and I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I, that I often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. Well, it's interesting. He said, I intended to come. Notice he's talking here about the, the will of God. See, this comes back to our plan subject to the will of God because I intended to come, <laughs> but I was prevented. It later he explains why, though, he was prevented. He said, because I, uh, at the end of the letter, he said, well, here's the reason I haven't been able to come is because I wanted to go where the gospel had not yet been preached first. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, labor uh, not where others had already labored. And so that was Paul's aim. And that's why he says at the end, of, he doesn't go into it here, but he explains that at the end of, of the letter that that's the reason he had not yet come to him. So at the end of the letter, he basically says, since he had then preached the gospel throughout that region, now then he could at last come to Rome. So we'll talk about that when we get to the end of the letter in chapter 15. In the year, let's see, what will that be? Let me calculate it really quickly. It'll be 
in May of 2033. So hopefully, uh, you know, we'll all still be, <laughs> we'll all still be around. No. All right. Well, notice then he says, but we've been prevented. But he says, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So in that word harvest, you see that? And so in other words, I, as Paul has been working among these Gentile areas and, and establishing churches among the Gentiles, he was uh, reaping a harvest, reaping a harvest. And that, um, that's the, the language that's used at the end of the letter too when he talks about um, his labor, with the, his presentation rather of the gifts, the, the collection of funds that he was making among the Gentile churches. Uh, as he was making his way back to Jerusalem to bring these funds to the needy saints there. And he referred to that, even though some translations uh, will use a different term, it's the same word he uses here. And it's, it's actually in the ESV translated fruit there. So it's the idea of what we uh, give to God and our work for God and the people that we encourage and help save in the Lord. That's all like a... Uh, a harvest. You remember Jesus talks about how in John 4, in John uh, 4, 36, about the Samaritans being, a, lift up your eyes and look and, see, look and see the fields white unto harvest. So he think, speaks of salvation in, in those terms. I mean, of uh, reaping uh, souls, saving souls in those terms. And then Paul speaks in a similar way uh, in Philippians chapter 1, that, that his desire to come and labor with them was to bear fruit uh, for God. I love Paul's perspective. And by the way, I forgot to slide this verse, and I wanted to mention up there when Paul said, I intended to come but was prevented. And he, he explains why later at the end of the letter. But, you know, Paul says something similar to the saints in Thessalonica. He writes to the church there and said, I wanted to come to you but Satan prevented it. Satan hindered it. So uh, we're praying for God's will to be done and for God to work uh, in a way that we, we desire. But then we also have to take into account that God allows the devil to operate in this world too. And I, I think of that here because he just, here he comes out and says, well, I, I've been prevented from coming. And in another context, he said, well, it was the devil that prevented it. It's interesting. Is it God that prevented it? Or your own change of plans? Or could it be the devil? just want to make sure I get that in there. See, that's why I'm doing this. So I can get all this in there and not miss anything. But, all right, so Paul uses the term harvest there. It's interesting to uh, speak of c coming there and working among the church. Here he says uh, in verse 14, then, see, that leads, you see how well this all segues because he says, see, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. And that, that's just a way of referring to other Gentile non-Greek speakers. They referred to him, you can hear in the uh, original term, and this is an alliteration of the term, but bar, 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 that sounds like, you know, people that didn't speak Greek and didn't know Greek were thought of as, you know, not as elite or intelligent or, you know, not like the, uh, not as, as good uh, as, the, as the Greeks. And uh, they were thought of as the barbarians. And when Paul, you remember when Paul was shipwrecked, what's the word that's used? This is the term that's used there when in Acts on his way to Rome, ironically, uh, Luke writes about how they were shipwrecked, and I just want to find that word because I didn't have it to put into the, into the, the chart uh, here or into the text here. But when they uh, were shipwrecked, what's the term that he uses, the ESV uses there? I'm going to find it. Hold on. I keep forgetting I can pause this. And so uh, it's the plural term Luke says in Acts 28 to uh, the, bar the barbaroi. Did I say that right? The barbaro, the the barbaroi. That's it. The the plural of this, but it's translated in the ESV, the native people. So we might think of ah the barbarians at the gate, like violent 
people, warmongering, primitive people, but it, it really was a way of just referring to Gentiles who were not Greeks. You had the, you had the Greeks, and then you had everyone else, the barbarians. So Paul's using this language. Notice, the Greeks to the Greeks and to the barbarians. In other words, all of them, to the wise and to the foolish. You know, he's been sent out to preach the gospel that to everyone, Paul said, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of culture, regardless of social status, the wise and the foolish, the Greeks and the barbarians. You notice how he wax, he's waxing poetic here, uh, as Paul often does. So I am eager, he says, because of that, that he feels this sense of obligation that the Lord has placed upon him. I'm under obligation. You see how seriously Paul took this and how earnestly he wanted to come. So he says in verse 15, So because of that, I am eager. I'm eager. And that's the same word. It's that same word translated uh, when Jesus uh, comes to the to the three disciples, to Peter, James, and John, that he told them to watch and pray in the garden. And uh, they were falling asleep, and he said, well, indeed, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this word used here, eager, is the same word translated willing there, and it can just mean that you're, you're willing to do it, but it carries the idea of, of you're, you're willing and ready. And so it suggests uh, that you are, are wanting to do it. And it could mean earnest and eager, like Paul said here. I'm eager. I'm ready. I'm ready to preach. Some translations say ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So notice, what does Paul want to do? He wants to, he wants to preach the gospel to them. He wants to preach the gospel to Christians? Yes. Yes, we don't just preach the gospel to the world. We preach the gospel to the church. And all that is entailed in the gospels, Paul's going to talk about in this letter. Uh, it's not just the, the core truths of the suffering of Christ for our sins and His resurrection from the dead for our justification, but then all the implications of that. But it in certainly includes that. That needs to be what gospel preachers are preaching to the church. We're gospel preachers. And Paul wants to preach it to those who are already Christians, and I may have already said this earlier, but sometimes you hear this expression that, um, well, no, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, hold off on that because I did think I mentioned that earlier. But he, he's eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. You see, then that leads us to what, I want to talk about in the class on Sunday morning. And so that sets us up to go to the, um, what is really the thesis statement of the tremendous theology that, that Paul is going to set out here, the message he's going to set out here for us and discuss at such length and elaborate upon in such detail. Uh, the thesis statement in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So we'll be able to jump into that in the next class. And so I didn't want to pass over all of this. Look at all of this that we have in these verses. If I had just jumped down and said, well, let's move on. Let's go ahead and let, let's look at verses 16 and 17. No, I wanted to do this, but you can see... Um, I like to get into it and talk about some of these things in detail. So I hope that was, hope all of that was helpful to you, and I hope um, it will help fill in the space here um, that uh, we're leaving in class, so that we can get to chapter one, verses sixteen and seventeen. But I just love all of this. I hope you do too. Okay, then. So may uh, God bless you until we are together. Again, much love to all of you.